A salary is the drug they give you when they want you to forget about your dreams. Welcome to the Corporate Dropout Podcast. I'm your host, Alessia Citro. After a successful career in tech, suffering from burnout, stress, and anxiety, I walked away from a multiple six-figure career to chase my passions and purpose as a coach and entrepreneur. This show is going to inspire, equip, and empower you to do the same. Let's get it. As a former Salesforce employee, I can tell you with confidence that every successful business uses a CRM tool. Why should yours be any different? Whether you're an entrepreneur, network marketer, or realtor, you need a way to keep track of your outreach to team members, prospects, and customers. Enter the 90-Day Habits Journal. Created by top network marketing leaders, the 90-Day Cycle to New Habits Journal is a great way to cultivate a winning mindset each day and track your activity. What you track grows, so start tracking what matters in your life and business. Get your copy at 90dayhabits.co and use code CITRO, that's C-I-T-R-O, for 10% off. Hello, friends. Today, I have the great honor and privilege of interviewing a true queen, Gina DeVee. Gina DeVee is the founder of Divine Living, a lifestyle and empowerment brand for women globally. She is the author of The Audacity to Be Queen, an accomplished speaker, a transformational coach, and a podcast host. Gina, thank you so very much for coming on the show. I got my copy of the book right here. My goodness, it is my pleasure and honor. I'm so excited for this conversation. So thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, truly an honor. I have to tell you too, before we kick off, I read The Audacity to Be Queen at a time in my life when I needed to pick it up. Like what you seek is seeking you. And I feel like it was just meant to be. Without exaggeration, what you wrote in these pages right here is what helped me have the conviction to leave my soul-sucking job, become a corporate Ah! dropout, and go on this mission to empower and lift up others. So thank you. Oh my goodness, I have the chills. Thank you for sharing that and using the content as it is intended. So Uh, great. Yep. Yeah, it's the perfect... I know we'll talk a lot about the book, but I think it's the perfect blend of the law of attraction, manifestation, spirituality the historical context as well of why this is so important for women and just Mm -hmm. all of it. It's just, it's one of my favorite books, truly. So thank you again. Mm -hmm. All right. So starting with your background, I think is critical because right now you're living this epic life of a queen, but it was not always that way. You came from really humble beginnings. So um, for those who haven't read the book, you grew up in the Midwestern suburbs in Michigan you had a really humble upbringing. Then you manifested this amazing Washington, D.C. experience in college, end up working at the White House. Then you moved yep. back in with your parents and rack up 75000 <laughs> in debt before yep. like, basically pulling out all the stops and living this epic life. Can you tell us a little bit more about those years and how they set you up mm-hmm. for the life of a queen that you're living today? Sure, sure. Um, it's It's so interesting to hear and relive those times, like almost feel like, I mean, it's such a part of me and it's even so hard to remember, um, just having that little capacity of self and human potential. So, uh, yes, my parents were school teachers, grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. Um, you know, just taught, was taught, go to college, get a job. And I did. And I basically, I did everything right, which was like just pathetically boring. I did go to college. I got a job. I didn't party. I um, had the student loan, $75,000 worth of debt. And I'm like at home at the age of 30, living with my parents. And I'm like helping other people live their best lives because it's like as a psychotherapist. And I was like, this, something went wrong somewhere. And it was just, I, I, I got out of hope addiction because I kept like waiting for my life to get better. And I kept thinking if I worked harder, then I'd make more money and I would get out of debt. Um, And I realized that as well-meaning as my surroundings and the adults in my life were, you know, Gina, you need to learn to live within your means. I got to this place where I was like, I don't want to learn how to live on $24,000 a year. Like I was like, it's like of all the work that I'd have to go into to play that small and be that tight I, I just, something else had to be available. And so when the student is ready, the teacher appears. For me, I think, 
you know, there were different people on the, the, the juncture. There was the Tony Robbins Hour of Power CDs that were out in the 90s. Um, there was Marianne Williamson and, you know, do what you love and the money will come. And I was like, what are these concepts? And I did start to believe them though. You know, I remember saying after listening to Tony Robbins thing, like I can make six figures. And it just sounded like, and my well-meaning, you know, my, I think my dad looked at me and he's like, no, you're not like, and he wasn't like, he's an elementary school teacher. He's like the nicest guy on the planet. Like, you know, um, and it wasn't until I really took a risk on me where I decided to leave as much respect as I have for the practice of psychotherapy, decided to leave Michigan, leave my home, leave my license and move to California and become a life coach. Still didn't know what I was doing, but at least it was going to be different because more of the same was going to be more of the same. And one thing just led to the next, you know, I think it was like, if I could tell my younger self anything, it would be keep following your bliss because that's where one connection to the next connection, to the next seminar, to the next book that just continued to open up my eyes uh, and teach me what I hadn't been taught. I didn't know that there was more than enough money in the world for everyone. I didn't know that there were more than enough clients for me. I didn't know that I could be, do, and have everything that I wanted. And when I got a hold of this information, I remember I was at a T. Harvecker seminar and I was like mind blown. I've never done drugs, but like, I felt like this was like acid or something. I was just like, what <laughs> you can do and be and like, I was like in like the second row, just, you know, the whole thing. And then I remember he had the whole audience hyped up and then he said, and the statistics are that 5% of you won't do anything with this. And I was like, what is he talking about? And I was like, why wouldn't we all just take this and run with it? And, um, I can't speak for other people, but I did take it and run with it. And that led me to the next seminar and the next awareness. Um, and I'll tell you what was succeeding. Wasn't hard. Struggling was. Mm. Oh man. Yep. That's, uh, that's a great fact and one liner, right? <laughs> So I, I want to back up a little bit too to what made you move to LA. I love this part in the book because you basically said something to the effect of like, if JLo can have it all, why the hell not me? <laughs> Which I just love. Like you and I actually have a lot in common in that regard. Like I did a cross country move with not much of a plan, but just a lot of self-belief and self-confidence. But mm -hmm. I feel like that's a rare thread. So I, I'm curious for the woman who's doubting herself, doubting that she's a queen, what, what can women like that do to boost their confidence and self-love and have this self-belief that's almost to the point of delusion is how I put it sometimes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it comes from, and I write about this in chapter three in the book, the injured feminine instinct. So we have the masculine qualities, which are within male and female logical, tangible, linear, action-oriented, initiating, doing, thinking, um, that kind of stuff. But ultimately, masculinity is about giving. And our culture has taught us that it's safe to be masculine, it's safe to be a man, it's safe to be logical and practical, and it's safe to give. So that's why women are always giving, giving compliments, giving praise, giving support, giving attention, giving time, money, whatever they've got. And the feminine side, it's about the spiritual, the playful, the passionate, the creative side of us. It's about being and feeling versus thinking and acting. And ultimately, femininity is about receiving. And somewhere along the way, because Western culture is so addicted to all things masculine, we've cut ourselves off from our feminine instincts, therefore our ability to receive. Receive attention, receive a compliment, receive love, receive money, receive visibility, all of that. And when you heal your femininity so that you're able to receive, you get how natural it actually is to just allow all forms of goodness into your life. So whatever it is you're looking to manifest. And then when you like get the game of life, that it's all about you 
getting clear about what your desires are, giving yourself permission to be who you are and being totally passionate, like declaring what will be in your life. And when you learn how to do that and as in functioning that it's already been done, it almost seems silly to worry about anything because you're in charge. Now it takes longer sometimes and there's some twists and turns, but you don't have to even give any attention to what you desire not happening. And the other thing I hear with that is not worrying about the how so much. Yeah. So I'll give you a recent example. This is not in the book. This is like fresh off the press. So um, I just spent the last 45 days in Italy. And part of why I was there was because I was looking for an Italian farmhouse. Me and my husband, I, you know, for wanted to find a place, renovate, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going all over Piedmont looking for the perfect Italian farmhouse. I narrowed it down to like this massive area to like a 20 minute radius. Like I want this, I want to live in this area. This is the components I want of the house, the view, the whole thing. And I finally find it like after 45 days of searching, like three hours this way, two hours that like the whole thing. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is it. And I go to the piazza with the real estate agent that afternoon. And I was like, okay, like I, like this, I need to get an architect to make sure I can do the renovations that I want. But like, you know, yes. And he's like, well, you know, someone else is looking at the property. And I was like, A, you're Italian and B, you're in sales. So C, please, <laughs> like I got you. Um, you know, this is like in like the whatever. And so he's like, okay, well, I just wanted to let you know someone else is looking at it. And I was like, great, but this is a Thursday. I'm going to get the architect. I'll call the architect tomorrow. We'll, we'll move on this. And he's like, you know, my favorite restaurant in the whole region is right near that house. And I was like, really, what's the restaurant? And he's like, La Cucinella. And I was like, oh, cool. Um, make me a reservation because I want to try it out. And before he left, he said, do you know what La Cucinella means? And I said, no. I said, my Italian is like Fendi, Versace, Gucci, Pico <laughs> Bianco, Vermentino, and Gavi de Gala. I mean, like, that's my Italian. <laughs> he says, Ladybug. And I remembered in that moment, three years ago, I wanted to move to New York. I was listening to a Gabby Bernstein book. She was talking about her house search and uh, some spiritual person said, look for a sign. And she said her sign would be an owl. And the spiritual teacher said her sign was dragonfly or something. And I was like, well, what's my sign? I'm looking for a place. I'm like, ladybug. This was three wow. years prior, completely forgot about it. Wasn't looking for a ladybug as I was going through Piedmont. And I was like, so mine, this is so mine. So <laughs> I call the architect the next day. And right after I call the architect at 9 a.m., which nothing happens in Italy at 9 a.m. anyways, but I call yep. the architect at 9. At 9.30, I get a WhatsApp, or no, I get a call from the agent. And he said, there was an offer placed on the house last night and it was accepted. The house is sold, it's gone. And I was like, honey. And my husband's bummed out. And I was like, Come on, people, have some vision, will you? First of all, you don't have to be a witch to know that if you sign a contract during Mercury and retrograde, it's going to fall apart. <laughs> Second of all, it's mine because I already got, I already liked it, and it was the ladybug sign. So, like, I couldn't even give this whole little dance any attention. And they're like, well, "I'm really," he goes, "I'm really sorry for your bad luck." And I was like. I'll tell you what, I'm like, if by any chance this deal doesn't go through, just give me a call. Like, I'll be here for another couple of weeks thinking no problem. So I go back to the Airbnb that we're staying at. We've stayed at here, this place, like, for years. There are certain bugs in the country. There's moths, there's little geckos, there's these other, like, little types of bugs that are there. But it's, it's, there's a certain cast of characters. I know what they are. I'm not a bug person, but it's that. And I'm sitting there doing my own, recording a podcast that day. And I look down on, there's something crawling across the floor. And I was actually telling the story about how my house, this guy thinks my house has been sold and I know differently. And there's something, and I was like, and I go and I look at it and I'm like, Glenn, you had to come here. And I was like, there's a ladybug crawling across the, and this ladybugs are not in October in Piedmont. I've never seen it. I've been there like I've been there for 45 days, never seen one. And I was like, 
I do, I'm not a bug expert, so I need to make sure it's not a tick or something that caused Lyme disease. I'm going to pop a post on Instagram saying, here's a ladybug. And everyone's going to be like, no, it's actually a tick. Um, and I was like, is this really a ladybug? And he's like, yes, this is a ladybug. And I was like, see, the house is ours. And he's like, you're nuts. Let's keep the search on. So they're like, there's no more inventory. We have nothing else to show you. I'm in Italy for a couple more weeks, whatever, people. Every day I, I like see where I'm going to, the kitchen is going to be remodeled, the whole thing. So we fly back Wednesday and th- yesterday was my like first like day back in. So it's unpacking and, you know, I'm just delightfully going about my business. Um, and I saw like a WhatsApp notification come in, but I was busy. So I didn't pay attention. And on our way to sushi, another one came in and I was like, what is happening? Cause it's only Europeans use WhatsApp. And so I was like, Gina, we just got the news today that for some reason the deal fell through on the other house. Oh my God. And I was like, of course it did. So now can we please contact the architect like I'd originally so he can go take a look at and my husband's like <laughs> you know it. And so I was like, of course. Why would I spend any time looking at the physical dimension? When I am the creator of my circumstances, I'm pressing into the universe. Like I didn't even need to, it was just when, it wasn't a matter of how, it was a matter of when. Yes. Oh my gosh. I just, I love that so, so much. That is an amazing story. And don't you feel like it's just so liberating when you know that like nothing that's meant for you gets away and you just have this ease about you? Like it was- I, I, mean, I think you say like re rejection is redirection. So even if that door had closed, it would be because there was a better farmhouse for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I was just completely surrendered. And like, you know, there's a, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, and it will be confirmed with two or three witnesses. So like, we don't have to blindly go through our lives and wonder that like, we get to ask the universe for confirmation two to three times so that we know that we know that we know. So A, I liked the place. B, like I'm not an astrologer or anything else, but it's signing a housing contract during Mercury and retrograde. Come on. And I got a ladybug restaurant and a ladybug walking across doing the catwalk on my floor. Like what else did God need to do to show me? Of course it's mine. Yeah. Uh, So this segues into one of the other questions I wanted to ask you. So I love the book for a lot of reasons. One is the way that you write. Like as I read it, I feel like I'm having wine night with a girlfriend and like having deep life conversations. Like it's just the writing style is so good. But I also love it because you do this beautiful job of infusing the spirituality with you know, law of attraction manifestation, which some people of Christian faith don't think go together. So (laughs) <laughs> right. So I'm curious, you, you talk about how you went to church three days a week growing up, also taught that you had to work really hard for money. How were you able to shed this programming to step into the type of mindset and abundance that you just shared with me? Yes. Um, by grace. I mean, I will share with you the practical steps, but it was really by grace. I feel that it's been, it's so, such a part of my calling. So um, for those of you that don't know, I grew up uh, in fundamentalist Christianity. So there, there are some downsides to that. But the upside is you have a re- great relationship with God from the get-go. <laughs> and so, um, and you know the Bible really well, too. So I grew up with the Bible, with a particular interpretation of the Bible. And so I always believed in God. I always believed in miracles. I always believed that we are loved. And used the Bible. I, 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 the church that I grew up in took the Bible so literally um, and and so rigidly that I was in a straitjacket with it for most of my life. And then, cue destiny. I meet Marianne Williamson in my twenties, and I would listen to her talk. And what she said, I knew was not a contradiction a contradiction to the scripture. It was, but it was a completely different vocabulary and kind of, you know, in, in traditional Christianity, a bit, you know, illegal, shall I say, um, or unchristian, you know, whatever, but my soul didn't resonate with it that way. And 
I actually realized that some of her metaphysical talk, so to speak, uh, illumined Bible scriptures to me in a way that became even more alive, not took me further away. And it was her talking about spiritual things symbolically that illumined my first um, awareness of the story of Esther in the Bible. Jews know it from Purim. And I started to, rather than just read the book of Esther, like it was about this woman in ancient times, but I also started to see my own story in hers because it's, it's yes, the story of a true life of a woman. And it's also the classic heroine's journey. And with my master's degree in clinical psychology, then I added the psychological of like leading women through this journey of becoming. And it all just started to make sense for me. Um, I was also prophesied over as a very young age. We're like really going to go to the Holy Spirit rally here. And I knew that one of the things in the prophecy was that I will, pro- it says, you will proclaim my name through industry. And for those that know traditional Christianity, Joyce Meyer always knew that she was meant to speak to the church. And I always knew it was meant to speak to the unchurched. <clears throat> so my work is for people of all faiths or no faiths, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not, that, so that's my work is to illumine these beautiful scriptures. So whether or not you're a Christian, you can be loved and supported and have spiritual principles to really support your truth and your destiny coming forth into the world. So um, the, that's the probably the longest way I could have said I gave myself permission to be spiritual, Christian and metaphysical. <laughs> And what was that journey like? Did it take you a while to sort of shed the dogma and just all of that programming? The um, Internally, it took a, a little bit because, you know, like I remember the first time I read The Science of Getting Rich and it was like, you will never live a full life unless you are abundantly rich. And I was like, ah, the devil. Um, <laughs> My, I should say like my brain said that my soul was like, oh, thank God someone's finally telling the truth here. Like, yeah. how am I supposed to do the work I'm meant to do in the world if I don't have a lot of money? Yeah. So I, internally, I would say I pretty quickly got it. What took me a lot longer was externally, like to really, uh, I was it took longer for me to drop my codependency and heal from my codependency, which is people pleasing. Mm -hmm. And so I was like afraid to kind of reveal certain vocabulary and what I really thought. And um, so that took longer, but today I'm pretty free with it because I have come to terms with like traditional Christians find me to not enough. And then um, the people that are in metaphysics, by, like I talk about the Bible and there's, you know, there's religious wounding or whatever. So look at, there's a line in the women who run with the wolves and Clara Pinkola Esti, Clarissa Pinkola Esti says, you have to howl so your pack knows where you are. Oh, oh my God. And there's a whole bunch of people that love my interpretation of the Bible and kind of metaphysical Christianity that works for them. And yeah. so why would I not speak my calling and my truth? Yes. Yeah. Because there's people like me who read it and it's like, oh, this is what I've known. And I just needed confirmation of it and to hear someone put it the way that I couldn't. So thank you for that. Mm-hmm. The people pleasing, by the way, is a good segue. I am a recovering <laughs> people pleaser. That's such a process, isn't it? And oh it, my, oof, a lot of shedding to do and peeling back layers of the onion, right? You talk about mm-hmm. leading life with feminine energy and that it's a, a way of being where you're thinking that, you know, I desire this versus I should, whatever yes. it is, right? And yes. I'm trying to eliminate the word should. Like so many people are walking around shoulding on themselves all day long. Yes. Um, what what would you say is the best way for a woman to get back in touch with the desires instead of shitting on herself? Mm-hmm. So I believe 
getting clear on your desires, listening to your desires and trusting your desires are three different steps. And it's steps of strengthening. And just like a physical muscle where strength grows in increments, so do the emotional muscles. It starts with slowing down. And there is like, I'm instantaneous gut instinct. Like I want everything fast. So I do, I haven't yet come to terms with patience being a virtue. I won't admit it yet. So like, that's like, so, <laughs> so for me to say slow down is it's, it's gotten to be a real pleasurable place because it's in the, the stillness that I can hear, hear myself and I can, I can actually check in and say, is this a should? Is this what someone else wants me to do? Or is this pure bliss? Is this pure pleasure? And when I am convincing myself one way or the other, yeah. well, it's, you know, it's not pleasure, but everything in life can't be pleasurable. So you need to do that, you know? Um, and yet we know that when something doesn't feel good, I'm not talking about feel good when it like it, doesn't feel good to like wake up early and go to the gym when you haven't been there in hypothetically 45 days. I'm talking about <laughs> the, <laughs> yes, asking for a friend. Um, what, the kind of feel good when you're like, this is off. This, this, this feels icky. This is, this is not me living my design, my truth. And because the conditioning is so strong and so loud to override our own preferences or make our preferences okay, it almost seems easier to just give in. You know, it's just easier to say yes. It's just easier to help out. It's just easier, like, and then I can get back to my truth in my life. But we take such detours emotionally, financially, spiritually, confidence wise, when we do that. So, getting to this place of understanding that if it doesn't feel good to you, that there's a reason. And I believe me, I know the fake it till you make it and hustle and no pain, no gain. It's, you can do it and it works if you're into the masculine way of doing things. Um, it doesn't, actually take a lot of courage. It might take a lot of discipline, you know, just like go to the gym, whether you feel like it or not, eat this, whether you enjoy it or not. And there is another way, but the feminine way is more invisible. It's more circular. It's less linear. We've not, we've not only not been taught to trust it, we've been taught to say it, that's crazy, right? You don't know what you're talking about. Like this is irresponsible. And so there is a process of reclaiming to get back to women listening to their desires and actually learning how to trust them, even when it's not logical. And this is where the spiritual principles will come in, because in the Bible says, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So if we're going to be spiritual, that means your thoughts don't actually make sense if you're comparing them to God's and if you're going to rely on man-made thoughts and you're going to get man-made results, I don't want to work that hard anymore. So I'm here for the miracles. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah. Doing less. And allowing and it to be you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Letting it, letting it be brought to you. I mean, the book is filled with other stories like that. Um, I could like, look at, in the masculine world of story I just told, I could have gone and pound the pavement. I could have said, I could have spent my whole two weeks wearing myself out, exhausting myself, looking for other places, trying to make something else happen. Instead, I um, had a blast, went to a bunch of parties, met new people, and just let the WhatsApp message come in. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. I think that that's a muscle that needs to be strengthened too, because we have been taught to not trust ourselves. Like one of the things you were saying, you know, being told that following the feminine instinct is crazy. I don't remember where I learned this, but the word hysteria or hysterical, the root of that is the same as like, like getting a hysterectomy, like, right. It's, it's demonizing that feminine wow. piece. Right. And so, I, yeah, there's a major wound that we all need to 
heal as women for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the tactical piece around that is go slower and listen. And you don't have to like necessarily do it on, on huge life things like should I get married or divorced or buy this house or that? Like you can start like, like chicken or veal or <laughs> fish or, you know, and just start like, well, I should get the chicken because it's, I don't know, less expensive or less calories. But what I really desire is the pasta. Um, you know, you'll start to see how my, when you're happy, when you're joyful, when you're blissed out, what a high functioning, healthy vortex you are in and attract. So I lose more weight when I eat what I desire because I'm happy and I eat less of it. When I'm eating something that doesn't taste as good to me because I was taught or when I did that, it was taught that it's less calories and I would eat more of it and I wouldn't lose as much weight. Mm, that's so, so true. You know, it's like really getting and, and starting, you know, faith is the evidence of things not seen. So it is developing a faith muscle. It is learning to, you know, and you'll start to collect your own experiences. You're like, Oh, you know, when I said yes to that desire, it didn't make sense initially, but then it led to this, it led to this, that led to that. And then you do it again and again, and you start to get like, yeah, this is actually a way of life that I'm, I'm digging. Yeah, it's just so much easier when you're just allowing and not stressing about, you know, oh, I have to eat white fish again tonight with, you know, half a cup of rice and, you know, a cup of green veggies. Like I did that for a while. And now, to your point, now that I'm eating what I desire, I, I haven't been gaining weight. It's funny how mm -hmm. that works. Mm -hmm. The happiness factor. So shifting gears a little bit to the business side. So you went from making 24,000 a year as a psychotherapist to mm -hmm. crossing seven figures within three years. So that's a major money mindset sh shift that took place. Mm -hmm. um, if you're so inclined, would you be willing to tell that money miracle story of what happened in the seminar? Or I mean, oh, you have a lot of money miracle stories. So any of them would be great. Yeah, but if you want the, the first financial miracle, I guess is always... Uh... It's a good one. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, when I was at that seminar, that Science of Getting Rich seminar, freaking at first freaking out that all of the um, content was going to like take me away from my faith and my belief that this was like the devil's work that we were so focused on money and all of that. But then I just really got, you know, like there is nothing spiritual about lack, constriction, being broke, playing small. And I was like, I'm out. And so I started to, I, you know, I, I went into this seminar. Well, all right, so let me back it up. So what happened was I was totally bro broke in Los Angeles. Rather than being consistently broke in Detroit on my $2,000 a month, I now got to be neurotically broke as a life coach because I was selling packages. And these packages were $6,000, which sounds sexy, but not when you sell one every four to six months, not as sexy. So I was down to $100 in my bank account. My credit was ruined. My family wasn't speaking to me at the time, but that's a whole another Oprah. Let's just suffice it to say I was depressed, had no friends, $100, didn't know where anything else was coming from. And um, I got a phone call from a friend of a friend who invited me to that seminar. And I was like, yes, I'll go. So I put $20 worth of gas in my car to show up in Orange County. I walk in and I got like my three ring binder. This was 2007, maybe um, my, my book that came with the seminar. And there was like this stack of DVDs on the table and the secret had just come out and everyone was talking about the secret secret. And I was so annoyed by it. And I stopped and I don't normally contemplate a $20 CD purchase this long, but when it is 20% of your net worth, you're going to like say, is this really what I'm supposed to do? But I, you know, being the risk taker that I am, I bought the CD, went, sat at the back of the room, totally looked around at these freaky Californians, like running around, hugging each other, high-fiving. I was like, this is why they say that California cult stuff. Like what is happening? Then the guy walks out on stage and is like, you can never be wealthy unless you're rich. And I was like, okay, it's of the devil. Except he was wearing a three-piece suit and had white hair and looked like most of the pastors that I went to church with in Detroit. So I was like, maybe there's something okay here. So 
He's sitting here uh, talking about how anything is possible and wealth consciousness that I'd never heard of before and that there is no lack of money in the world and everything's about your decision and your declaration. I was like, I could just literally feel my frequency raise. It was like I started out in depression and stressed and freaking out. And then it's like just belief, 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 positivity, awareness, truth, you know, and I was like, yes, yes. So like my, as my frequency is building, like I get to the place in the seminar where I make the decision because a decision means to cut. And I said, I will no longer again say I would love to, but I don't have the money. That was my mantra through life. Like, oh, Gina, you want to come to dinner? I'd love to, but I don't have the money. Gina, want to take a trip? I'd love to, but I don't have the money. And I also made a decision with $60 in my bank account that I would never again struggle financially. And I didn't know how. I was just like, I am over this. This is so boring. This is so not me. And so um, that was like one of those multi-speaker events. And so like the next speaker came on and it was a lady and she was awesome. And I was like, this is amazing. And she goes and she does her pitch and it's for a $17,000 coaching program. And I was like, well, no problem. I got this. I mean, I like weaseled myself into every retreat, seminar, whatever, you know, I'll pay you back later was my thing. And so I went up to her on the break and I was like, hi, I'm Gina. I'm going to be your new star student. I'm so excited about the new program that you've got coming out. Um, I just have one question for you. Do you have a payment plan? I don't know why I would have asked for a payment plan. I didn't have a corporate salary. I didn't have an inheritance coming in. I didn't have any known form of cash showing up at all. But I asked... Just basically, it was my stall technique. And she said no. And I was like, this rich, like, <laughs> who has $17,000? Like, I never knew anybody that had $17,000 in one chunk. And I was pretty sure that if I did have $17,000, I wouldn't even need her coaching because that was like the epitome of life solved. So I was like, and then there was another woman that came up and she had a $10,000 program. And I had just told myself I would never again say I'd love to, but I don't have the money. And I was like, this financial struggle ends here. So I filled out all 16 digits of my debit card with expiration date and turned the form into her assistant. And I said, you give me two weeks before you run that card. And I put the three ring binder under one arm and the secret under the other and drove back to LA with all my new techniques. I see myself with $30,000 in two weeks. I see myself with 30, I see myself being coached by these coaches. I, I feel myself with $30,000 in my Wells Fargo online banking. Like I was doing the visualizations, the mantras, the feeling it and over and over again. My husband is like, Gina, what are we going to do with you? And I was like, no. We will speak nothing other than the complete and total manifestation of the entire realized dream. I see myself with $30,000 in five days, in four days, in three days, in two days. There was, we'll call him Bill. Bill is in my living room, I think it was, because that's where I my office was. And Bill... Uh, was completing his six-month package of marriage coaching. And he was like, Gina, this has been great. My marriage is in great condition. He's like, great, great, Bill, great. And I didn't know enough about business to like re-enroll or anyways, what was $6,000 going to do for me anyways? I needed $30,000 in 48 hours. So I was just like, great, Bill. I'm, I'm glad your marriage is great. And he's like, you know, I've been meaning to talk to you, thinking about having you coach my sales team. I'm like, this was the one thing. I knew he was like a wealthy businessman, but I didn't know what he did. And I stayed away from it because I didn't need him to know I was an idiot when it came to all things business or money or whatever. <laughs> I was like, your handle, but anything else, not so much. So I was like, yeah. I was like, well, um, what is it that you sell? Basement waterproofing, he says to me. I'm like... Really, universe? Like, ba- like I did not look that differently than I do today. Basement <laughs> waterproofing people, and so I'm just like, um, Bill, how many people are on your sales team? I'm like, what? That sounds like a smart business question to ask. What am I supposed to say? And he goes, ten. I'm out. Like, I got nothing left. I got nothing left to say. I have no more expertise. I had no what to do except get him out of my office because I didn't like where this was going because I was about to look like an idiot. And then he says, 
So what do I do? Buy 10 of those $6,000 packages of yours? Wow. Bill, of course, it's exactly what you do. And in two weeks, not 30, but $60,000 was wired into my account. So I could go and buy my coaching programs and go to San Tropez. Wow. Oh man, that's unreal. Well, and I, I'm curious, we'll go on a tangent with this, but I'm curious how you learned how to coach basement waterproofing salespeople. I mean, sales is sales, right? Like you sell the pen, whatever, but that... <laughs> you go with, <laughs> you you the occasion. really fast and learn what <laughs> basement waterproofing even is. <laughs> and you get really resourceful really quickly. <laughs> mm. Well, and you know what? Where there's a will, there's a way, right? Um, so I want to ask you too, now you've scaled your business to multiple seven figures. And I've... So before I was a corporate dropout, I worked at Google and prior to that Salesforce. And I, I like to say I was almost like a business consultant that solved your problems by selling you software that would fix it, right? Okay, cool. Huh? The common denominator that every business I worked with struggled with was scale. So tell me a little bit, how were you able to scale this? I watched one interview where you were like, you know, you need to not be doing your own sales calls, like at a certain point, all of that. Like, how did you go from 24 grand a year to multiple seven figures with ease? Mm -hmm. um, well, and, and it wasn't all easy. So I, I do want to say, you know, there's a level of perseverance and tenacity and risk and stuff not working out and being able to brush yourself off. So it wasn't grueling. There were, there were things that would have been grueling, but this was not one of them. Um, so I started out, so I was burnt out as a therapist with the one-to-one -one model. So I went to the one-to-many. So my first class was a group. And that's how I went from 24,000 to 250 in my first year is that you know, it's like real estate. You, you're going to do the same amount of work for a $100,000 house, a million dollar house or a $10 million house. So I realized if there were three people in the class or 30 people in the class, I'm going to still be there for that two hour call. So that was the first way that I went to scale. And then I missed the intimacy of being in the smaller groups or one-on-one -on -one and in person. So then the next scale that I did was own and, and all, all, you know, we can talk about scaling in terms of business, but what it really is, is a personal evolution. So you have to become more of yourself for there to be more, you know, everything externally is just a reflection of the internal. So I don't want anyone getting too linear, like this is like a math problem that has a solution. Um, so, as you, so you're hearing me listen to my desires. I was craving this in person, but I couldn't go back to one-on-one -on -one intimate stuff because then the salary would go back. So I started asking the better questions and I started incorporating more of me and my passions. What was I passionate about? Of course, personal development, transformation, and what I was not admitting publicly at the time, luxury. So I started raising my rates. So, rather, so I did one-on-one. -on -one. And I did uh, small groups, but I started to really raise the rates because my wealth consciousness had raised. I was doing things in a luxurious setting. There's all, and then on a practical business level, there's always room for the luxury market. There's always people that are going to do it for less, you know, and cheaper. But there's always a group of people that are going to want the best. So whatever they, they deem the best. So I raised my rates and then I real so that got me to a half a million. And then I was like, started, like, I think video was starting to come out, not to sound like I'm like 124 on a rocking chair, but like, you know, this was like <laughs> circa 2007, nine, somewhere there. Um, I had a 5,000 person list and I wasn't into the whole tech thing. I mean, I know I had an online business, but it just, it's not why I got into this. I got into it for transforming lives and my superpower is around coaching and speaking. So I was like, well, I desired to now go from the half a million to a million. So I did it with 12 clients. I sold 12 people, $100,000 package. 
1.2 million. So as lovely as that was and amazing and, and meaningful and lucrative, in services, if you're offering services, you're still a high paid waitress at the end of the day. You're still trading dollars for hours, even though it's a much more pleasurable ratio. And then I, and I'd been starting to do live events and those had gotten exhausting for me. And I was like, I want to do a multiple seven. Now I want to go to multiple seven figures and I don't want to do it through live events and I don't want to do it through one-on-one. And so I decided to do it through a video launch and open up my Divine Living Academy. And that was the first multiple seven figure launch I did from a video series. I didn't have to do an event and blah, blah, blah. So I sold the Academy and then I didn't plan on doing any like higher level masterminds or whatever, but the the audience asked for it. They're like, but we want more. And I was like, okay, well then here's a 10 and I think the Academy was 7,500. And then there was a 10 and a 25 level mastermind opportunity. Um, And then uh, you know, started to get involved more with like funnels in the digital space. And now that, um, you know, when my volume was always so low, so I had to go higher dollar to meet the financial goals. And now that I was at that place, I could go lower dollar because there was more mass. And so then how we've continued to grow and scale and sustain is through lower priced programs. Predominantly, I may mean, still do some high end stuff, but the main bread and butter of the business model was lower priced programs for more of the masses, the book, you know, et cetera. Um, and if you really want to sneak peek, cause I haven't really even talked about this yet. One of my newest endeavors is what I realized is, so that's great too. Cause that's like meaningful work, awesome people making a difference in people's lives. And it's still a launch every time you want to go you know, and launches for me are not pleasurable. I don't, I don't really enjoy them. I enjoy the the work once people are in, but don't enjoy a launch, never have. And, and I was just like, I don't want to have to, like, I haven't cracked the code on actual passive income, leveraged income. Yes. Um, consistent income. Yes. But like true, pa- like the joke in this industry is like, do you know how many hours a day you have to work to make passive income? Like, cause you're like, tinkering with a conversion rate in a funnel and you're working like 12 hour days to get your funnel to work. And it's like, what is passive about that? No thing. And I don't even like that kind of work. I'd rather coach all day. And then an opportunity came to me where I instantly said yes and involved me getting my real estate license. So um, you're going to start to see me talk a lot more doing my work. I'm not leaving transformation and coaching. I'm adding a real estate component to it that uh, specifically is around passive income to s- continue to scale the divine living empire that way. That's awesome. Yeah, my husband and I just got into real estate too. In May, we closed on a property in Maui, a rental property. Congrats! Which, thank you. What, that's a whole other story of manifestation, which I won't tell you in the interest of time. But um, suffice to say, it did not rent for three months because we went with the wrong property manager. Now this place is like, it's booked. Booked. Great. Yeah. So now, so we're like, hey, like true passive income. So yeah, I think real estate is a really, really smart move. So, oh my gosh, I could keep talking to you for like five more hours, but I know both of us need to run. Um, so yeah. I wanted to just close with, you know, telling you, you are a true inspiration. There's a quote I wanted to share from the book too, that just resonates so much. And you say that with every epic life comes a double blessing when you yeah. show up confidently fully expressed and modeling what's possible, it by definition blesses you and those lives that you positively affect. So thank you. You're, you're absolutely doing that. And if you're listening to this, this is your sign to show up, right? Yes. Like show up for other people. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. So before we sign off, where can people connect mm-hmm. with you? Where can they find you? Where can they get the book? All of that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, all things are at divineliving.com. So come on over to divineliving.com for the book. You can go to forward slash book for the free companion course, the book, you can go to forward slash audacity. And I have a podcast divine living and you can follow me on Instagram at Gina DeVee. 
Well, thank you so much again for being here. And uh, tune in right after this. We'll be recording a business tip mini episode that you won't want to miss. Did you know we're in the midst of the great resignation? 4.3 million Americans left their jobs in August without seeking a new one. If you want to become a corporate dropout like me, but you need help creating an exit plan, I can help. Whether you need corporate exit coaching, business coaching, or you're seeking help to step into the best version of yourself, I'd love to connect with you. Listeners of the Corporate Dropout Podcast can book a complimentary discovery call with me. Visit alasiacitro.com slash dropout. That's A-L-E-S-S-I-A-C-I-T-R-O dot com slash dropout to book your free coaching call today. Thank you so much for listening to the show. If today's episode added value to your life in some way, please subscribe, leave a five-star review and share it with someone who needs this. I'd love to connect with you on Instagram and hear how the show has inspired you. So tag me or slide into the DMs. Find me at Corporate Dropout Official or Alessia Citro. That's A-L-E-S-S-I-A-C-I-T-R-O and two underscores. Until next time, remember that you're a badass, stay focused, stay hungry, and dare to drop out. <laughs>